Good morning, class. Fasten your seatbelts because we're about to embark into the exciting world of slime molds. Did I tell you about the time where the janitor paid me 12 bucks to jump off the rotunda? Yes, we and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the meaning of life. Any questions? Yes, Timmy. Um, is this going to be on the test? <sighs> yes, everything we learn is on the test. Just a reminder that we're having a quiz tomorrow afternoon on sections 1 to 3, and I'm holding an extra help session today after school if you have any questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, your time is now up. Please put down your pencils and do not leave until I've collected your papers. <sighs> All right, let's see what we got here. Yeah, uh, you know what it is. Marking papers, marking papers, marking papers, marking papers. Seriously? You've got to be kidding. Why, why, why? <sighs> There's got to be a better way. Clearly this just isn't working. Well, why'd you do it? What? Sir, Sir Ken Robinson? Why? Why do I teach? Well, I do it because I want to instill a sense of wonder and curiosity in these kids. I would love to do that. I do it because I want to teach these kids about inquiry and discovery and how to become lifelong learners. I do it because I love teaching. I think what you mean is you like the idea of it. What do you mean? I meet all kinds of people who don't enjoy what they do. They simply go through their lives getting on with it. They endure it rather than enjoy it and wait for the weekend. Well, I guess I feel that way sometimes. I know my students do. But why is it like that? Why do I have so much trouble engaging my students? It's not a problem of teachers or particular schools. It's a system problem. It's to do with the ideology of education in which people are working, the things they take for granted as being true. In many cases, in my opinion, uh, things that are not true. Like what? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, uh, ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. I guess that explains why schools are so obsessed with standardization and measuring output and quantifying individual learning. Testing is a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, often conducted uh, in the hands of people who know very little about education. I would love to engage my students in interesting and creative activities, but so often I feel like I'm at a loss for time in trying to cover all the required curriculum content. What really I think most people find exasperating when, is when well-intentioned, if they are, uh, politicians decide they're going to take control of a, a process they don't know, uh, promote ideas they only half understand, uh, and remove the one thing that improves education, which is the discretion and creativity of the people actually doing the work. And I think, it's, I think it's an historic battle, and I really encourage you to engage with it, because I think it's important that we don't let this drag on for another generation. I really do. But this is the way it's always been. I mean, there's been reform after reform, and ultimately nothing has changed. Reform is no use anymore, because that's simply improving a broken model. What we need is not evolution, but a revolution in education. Well, what do you suggest? It's not about scaling a new solution. It's about creating a movement in education in which people develop their own solutions but with external support based on a personalized curriculum. We have built our education systems on the model of fast food. You know, there are two models of quality assurance in catering. One is fast food, where everything is standardized. The other are things like Zagat and Michelin restaurants, where everything is not standardized. They're customized to local circumstances. And we have sold ourselves into a fast food model of education. And it's impoverishing our spirits and our energies as much as fast food is depleting our physical bodies. Well, thank you, Sir Ken Robinson. I agree with what you're saying, but I'm still not clear on how I can actually implement these changes. What can I do in my classroom tomorrow morning to help engage my students? Who's there? 
I'm Don Tapscott. Oh, hi, Don Tapscott. You understand where I'm coming from, don't you? You try hard as a, as a teacher in public school or high school to engage students, but when you've got a class size of 30, uh, 35 kids, it's tough to do that. You're in the broadcast mode a lot of the time. Exactly. It goes like this. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge. You're a student. You're an empty vessel. You don't have knowledge. Get ready. Here it comes. I'm a transmitter of data, you see, and your goal is to take it into short-term active working memory and through practice and repetition to build deeper cognitive structure so you can recall it to me when I test you. I recognize that this broadcast model isn't effective at engaging or inspiring students. All they end up doing is memorizing and regurgitating large quantities of facts and content, but it does nothing in terms of teaching them to become effective lifelong learners. This is a punctuation point in human history where many of our institutions have come to the end of their life cycle and they can no longer take us forward. But if this was the method that was used for centuries, why all of a sudden are things so different now? There's a new generation that learns differently. The first generation to come of age in the digital age. This is a generation that has different brains. They process information differently, they learn differently, and overall, this is for the better. How are their brains different from previous generations? Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. My generation, the baby boomer, spend 24 hours a week of watching uh, television. And these kids watch a lot less TV and they watch it differently. They come home, they turn on their computer and they're in three different windows and talking to their uh, friends and listening to an MP3 player and they got three magazines uh, open and uh, they got a video game going on this. Oh yeah, and they're doing their homework and uh, the television is going on in the background but the TV is sort of like ambient media, it's sort of like music. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipient, recipients of some of the video, they're reading, thinking, organizing, learning, collaborating, composing their thoughts, authenticating. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising audience, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school. Well, all right, so what can I do to make it less boring? Leading research shows that students learn much more effectively when they work together collaboratively to solve a problem than when they just passively listen to a teacher talk. We need a new model that's the student focused, multi way, customized and where this, the students can collaborate and learn together and collectively as they continue out into the workforce to be able to work and learn and collaborate together. I try to engage my students in group work inquiry activities, but because grades are ultimately assigned on an individual basis, I get the sense that true collaboration is often stifled and that there's more competition than collaboration in these circumstances. What can I do to reconcile the goals of collaborative learning communities with our current grades-based meritocracy? Hey, it's Professor Jim Slada. I've seen some of the work that you and your amazing Encore group have developed, and it's truly inspiring. Based on your research, what are your thoughts on how I can break away from current broadcast models of pedagogy and implement effective collaborative learning strategies in my classroom? It's like Sir Robinson over there says, there is no fix for this. But for me, I see it as a matter of evolution, not fixing or breaking. Basically, if schools are going to change into places of social learning and inquiry learning, and I think many of us believe that they will, then they will need positive examples of how such learning can occur, and some kind of scientific evidence that the kids really learn from these approaches. Teachers will need models of how to coordinate these new kinds of instruction, and there will be a whole bunch of new challenges related to materials, assessments, learning goals, and other things like course topics and school schedules. I don't really think it's my business to be telling schools what they should do, I just need to keep my mouth shut and do my work and not try to suggest that I know what kinds of things schools should be doing right now. But you're a learning scientist. Shouldn't you have all the answers? Learning scientists shouldn't even try to push schools one way or the other. And that's especially true if we don't have a clear argument or evidence about the ideas we're pushing. It's easy for me to say, I think kids should learn collaboratively through inquiry, engaging with the ideas, in robust exchange with their peers. But can I prove that? Can I even give some good examples of how that kind of learning occurs? 
Can I show you a model that can be used by teachers in any topic area to recreate their own designs? And can I explain why it works on a theoretical level? Until I can do those things, I need to keep my head in my work, which in my case involves developing new models of learning and conducting careful, school-based research projects that evaluate those models. I get the sense, though, that a lot of the educational research that's taking place occurs in the ivory towers of academia and is far removed from the realities of actual classroom practice. For instance, when I look at the limited technological resources available in the public school system, I still get the impression that these collaborative learning opportunities will only be available to the privileged few who can afford them, thereby widening the existing disparities in education between socioeconomic classes. It's not like I'm locking my work away in an ivory tower or conducting it in a sterile laboratory, but I'm certainly not going to encourage anyone to consider my work as being ready for adoption by schools. First of all, I don't feel that I've managed to get anything to the point yet where I can say with confidence that the designs and the learning games are reliable, that I understand where the learning's coming from, that I know what students and teachers should be doing at all points in time, or that I feel is replicable. Second, my model of learning and all of my group's curriculum designs seems to be going in a direction that I think wouldn't be too easy for conventional schools to adopt. The kinds of curriculum that we're studying would be better suited for longer class periods, more integrated curriculum, and a focus on depth rather than breadth of coverage. So even if we had everything working smoothly and reliably, it doesn't seem to me that our work would be easy to extend into the current school context. I hope I'm not sounding overly cautious, but I've been down the road before of pushing research-based approaches into real classrooms and it can make a mess of the agendas on both sides of that aisle. So, hypothetically speaking, how do you imagine education to be in the future? In particular, how do you envision the institutions of formal schooling changing? No matter what, schools will change. Institutions evolve, constantly. Like organisms within an ecology, where even the ecology itself, which in this case would include society, culture, and the nature of students and teachers, is changing. Sir Robinson, Larry Cuban, Andy DeSessa, and many others are saying that schools today are no different than they were a hundred years ago, which is an interesting image, and I agree that some of the core features of schooling are probably vestiges of the industrial era, but I think that schools really are very different today, even from 20 years ago, and they'll be even more different 20 years from now. It's like Tapscott here says, the kids themselves are changing. What he didn't mention is that the teachers are changing too, and these kids today, they're going to be the new batch of teacher candidates in just 10 years. These kids are not just growing up, they've grown up digital. They're into the high schools and into the universities now in unprecedented numbers. And they're coming into the workforce, into the marketplace, they're becoming teachers. And there's no more powerful force to change education than the students. So all the participants, as well as the whole social surround of schooling, are shifting. It's impossible for schools not to change. Hmm. Well, that brings me back to my question about technological access. This is not about technology. It's about a change in the relationship between the student and the teacher and between students and the learning process. You asked about using advanced technologies in schools, and it's true. Many of us are excited about it, particularly the tangible and immersive technologies, as well as the ones where kids pool their voices, their votes, or their ideas, and then the whole community gets to look at that data and respond to it. It's not a matter of access, necessarily. And yes, many schools don't have high bandwidth internet or projectors in every classroom, but until someone is standing on a street corner waving a pamphlet that shows how such technologies are really helping kids learn better, it's not like any crime is being committed here. I think internet technology is going to make the process of evolution much quicker and more responsive in education, and it's going to keep teachers very much at the heart of the chain. The internet's not centralized, and this means that people are not passive, they're not an audience, they're not recipients, they can become the actors, they can become the initiators, the users, the publishers. Human communities depend upon a diversity of talent, not a singular conception of ability. I think for the future we need to evolve systems of education and of organizational planning and of community development, which are based on a model of diversity rather than of conformity. So what do I think schools will be evolving into? Do I think that 45-minute lecture and lab sessions and K-12 through grade structures are the way of the future? Let's just say it's easier for me to imagine scenarios where they're not. 
These are big cultural shifts that are happening. I think there's a general paradigm shift happening. There's a transformation. Even this conversation, you know, is an important part of that. I can envision a much more fluid, interactive and changeable learning environment and maybe one where the schedule isn't so fixed. It also seems likely to me that schools will remain closely connected to the communities in which they operate. Every school is different. Every classroom is different because they've got people in there. One thing that the learning sciences has demonstrated with solid evidence is that there is a relationship between what we learn and how we learn. For decades we've been investigating different ways of learning and showing how those ways of learning affect the outcome in terms of what kids learn. But there's another level to this discussion that has to do with the relationship between how they learn and why they learn. If we want students to learn in a different way, like through collaborative inquiry, then we need to figure out how to get them to reconsider their basic reasons for learning. It's not about getting a grade, it's not about acquiring skills, it's not about doing better than your peers. What is it about? You're raising some excellent questions that really drive at the philosophical core of this whole discussion. And it also brings to the table the underlying assumptions as to why kids are in school in the first place. Why are kids in school? I think it would be an interesting question to ask a hundred teachers. I bet most of them would have answers that are more or less the same stories they had when they were in school. To get a good job, to gain social skills, and so on. Maybe rewarmed with some jargon from their pre-service, like lifelong learning or 21st century skills. Basically, when we change students' and teachers' answers to the question of why they are learning, we'll quickly change the how and then the what. I find this to be a very fascinating relationship that keeps me on the edge of my chair. I agree. It's absolutely fascinating particularly since these are questions that seem to transcend disciplinary boundaries and require the very type of collaborative problem solving they seek to address. Thank you all for such an engaging and informative discussion. Do you have any final words of wisdom? It's a hard problem, and no one should expect quick results. You can't force progress in theories of learning, and you can't have applications for learning without the theory. It's not about standardizing but about raising standards, and that's something different. Victor Hugo says there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The time has come for us to reinvent education, and thankfully we have a new generation that is going to make it happen. What's this? We're ready to morph into action! I come from the net. Through systems, peoples, and cities. To this place. Heroes in a half shell. Turtle power. All right, this is going to be our last audition for the day. Who's up next? I am Morpheus. Wow, Morpheus, are you for real? What is real? Huh? How do you define real? <laughs>